Attention, mech warriors and crew, we are 15 minutes out from the drop point. Until then, please stand by with dropship banter. Over. Hey guys, it's Frozen Front, and welcome to Dropship Banter. This is part two of a two-parter where I am going to be defending Capellan still. Or at least trying to justify it. So, to be perfectly honest, I was presently surprised by all the replies from that first episode. I really, really expected to just get hammered 10 ways to Sunday. But honestly, we had a lot of good conversations and a lot of good points were made. Do I still think Capellans are not evil? Yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna lie, I still don't think they're evil. I don't even think they're that bad. But I have to give the devil its due and I have to admit when I'm wrong. Yes. The Capellans have done some very awful, awful things. And there's no getting around that kind of argument. So, in light of that, and to be fair, I've decided to make this second part, did the Capellans do anything right? And to answer that, I have broken down what people have suggested to me, or commented, or put in counter to what I originally said, and I'm gonna cover them. Six points, nothing special. So I'm just gonna go down this list and here we go. All right, going off the first and probably the most commented response that I got in terms of people telling me why they think Capellans are evil or why people think Capellans are evil is the belief that in early world building and lore with regards to Battletech, authors drew their inspiration from the Capellan Confederation based on their time, i.e. they based it off Communist Russia, USSR, and Communist China, with a little bit of dictatorships from around the world in between. Ugh, oh god, I'm gonna have to walk on eggshells with this one. Let, l give me a second to center. Okay, yes, having looked at the timeline in correlation to early writings of Battletech, a lot of the novels and lore was based at the very tail end of the Cold War. As well as the weird in-between to whatever era we're in right now. This means that there was a lot of fear of nuclear obliteration. There was a lot of fear of resurgent powers. Economically, I mean, in terms of both Germany and Japan. That's why we have the Draconis Combine and the Laren Commonwealth. And... Authors and writers of Battletech had to find some way to justify why, i.e. good guys, were fighting bad guys. So they just copy and pasted what they thought was evil. Do I agree with that? I do not agree that labeling an entire society, people group, or religion as evil and using them as a straw man and vilifying them is a good idea. I don't think that's very positive and I don't think that's gonna make for good storytelling. However, I am not in a position to judge those authors or writers. It was a different time. I was born outside of the Cold War. I don't know what it means to literally be in fear of being nuked. And they express that fear in Battletech. And if that's even a hint of what they thought was going to happen, then yeah, I can understand why they wrote the way they wrote. Do I agree with it? No. Do I think that it needs to change? At the expense of angering a lot of people that like the canon, I, I'm also not in a position to say that either. I don't think that retconning what was originally written is a good idea. It's never a good idea to just retcon stuff. Maybe, maybe my only hope to this whole response is that as we move forward in the Battletech timeline, we're slowly going to see a change from one dimensional writing of the quote unquote villainous factions, the Capellan Confederation, the Draconis Combine, and to a lesser extent, the Lyran Commonwealth. And we're gonna see more of a multifaceted array of how they operate how their main characters react and respond within the universe and oh god you know what i'm gonna stop right now because i know i'm gonna cause a flame war so that's my hope my hope is in the future 
the writing that was previously just vilifying Capellan Confederation as just bad guys is going to change a little bit and get better. And thankfully, as people have also pointed out, the new books are going to start covering those aspects. Maybe not the government aspect of the Capellan Confederation, but its citizens and why they feel the way they feel. And that's good. Let's look on the positive. We're going to get to see a new side of the Capellan Confederation that has not been covered in a long time. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave this one here because if I say anything, I'm pretty sure it's going to just cause a flame war. So let's leave it at that. <sighs> All right, moving on to point two. Oh boy, okay. This is what I'm going to have fun with. The Torian Concordant invasion and the breaking of the Ares Convention restrictions are a complete and total reason why the Capellan Confederation are evil. Oh man. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. People hated how I defended Capellans for their right to defend themselves and attack other inner sphere states. They're going to love what I justify why they can freaking invade people. Okay, to the people who do not know what I'm mumbling on about, I'm going to give a quick short overview on what this is all about. So the Torian Concordant, from my understanding, is one of the major periphery powers if not the major periphery power. They are honestly a mix of Space Texas and Switzerland, to a degree. Do not like the Inner Sphere. They want nothing to do with the Inner Sphere. They just want to be left alone. To just trade and do what they will outside of their control. Which, yeah, pretty cool. I've got no problems with them. But in response to that, they did not sign the Ares Convention. Now. What is the Ares Convention? In early Battletech lore, there was a gathering of the minds within the Inner Sphere and the Periphery to kind and create a limitation and a rule set to warfare. I.e. no more driving around in giant spaceships and just nuking planets to oblivion because soon there ain't going to be no planets left. This was formed, in part, due to the requests of the Capellan Confederation. So before you even start, let it be known that the Capellans were also the ones who started this whole convention and wanted to prevent nuclear obliteration. So there, to everyone who says they're evil, there's one point to the Capellans. Now, all the major powers were invited and all of them signed off except for two. One of those two were the Torian Concordant. Why did they not sign? Well. They didn't trust the Inner Sphere, as I've already said. They thought it was a load of BS, they thought no one was going to obey these rules, it was stupid, and they literally just picked up their toys and went home. Thinking that they would not suffer any kind of ramifications. That's already... freaking strike one against the Torian Concordant. Now, to be fair, in response to this, the Capellan Confederation, realizing after signing the Ares Convention that there was no actual means to expand in the Inner Sphere, turned around and said, all right, who can we possibly try to take over in order to expand? Well, the Torian Concordant didn't sign, so bingo, bango, bongo, they are the target. And, okay, here, you know what? Because I know I'm already pissing off Torian Concordant fans, here's your one minute of just you didn't time to shine or your time to shine here you go i'm gonna give it to them the capellan confederation invaded and oh boy was that a mistake because they just got the stuffing beat out of them the torian concordant did not back down they literally formed a literal line in the sand and said come get some and for every inch of ground taken the capellans paid with 10 gallons of blood and 100 bodies in the ground. Like, it was bad. Maybe maybe in the future, if I can find a book, I'll do an entire episode and, I don't know, talk about relations between the Inner Sphere and the Periphery. Maybe, maybe later. But after all was said and done, handful of planets, maybe three, I think, three planets were taken, and the Capellans were left in a very vulnerable state. Meanwhile, the Torian Concordant felt justified, saying, this is the Inner Sphere, this is the worst. The Capellans are the exact example of why we didn't sign it and have ever since been hostile to any kind of excursion from the Inner Sphere into their territory. Now, is this morally justifiable for the Capellans to do? No, I'll give you guys that. It is not justifiable that the Capellan Confederation decided to just walk in there and try and take them over. 
I mean, I, I, you, you know that I can't justify the Capellan Confederation doing that. That's not fair. So, fine. You want to play that game? I'll play this game too. Strategically, yeah, it makes sense for the Capellans to invade the Torian Concordant. And here you go. Oh boy. <laughs> God, I can already... I don't know much about the Torian Concordant in terms of lore, but I know that people in the fandom love these guys. Like, they are number one in terms of people who love, like, the periphery states. So I know I'm about to really anger some people. Here, here's... Okay, instead of ranting, here's my perspective. The Capellan Confederation knew that if they didn't go in first, someone else would. I.e. the Federated Sons. The Federated Sons had already had their eyes on the Torian Concordant. They wanted it, and they were going to invade. They had the same idea that the Capellans had. If the Ares Convention is going to limit the ability for us to wage war, we're going to have to hit a target that literally is not part of that whole restrictions. And we can't expand anymore in the Inner Sphere because everyone will be playing by these rules, and if we don't, well, we're going to get freaking screwed. So, the Capellans decided to move first. Why? To prevent the Federated Sons from having a beachhead to attack them on another side. And to prevent them from becoming economically stronger, and to prevent them from expanding their influence, yada yada yada. Is this right? I mean... No. No, it's not right. But it strategically makes sense. And you know what? Alright, fine. I can't defend it. I, I, I will give... I will give ground. I can't define the def God, whatever. I can't defend what the Capellans did. It was wrong and on both fronts. They broke the Ares Convention and they invaded a periphery state that did nothing to deserve it. But here is my response to that since you want to play this game. Again, I will reiterate that if the Capellans did not do it, the Federated Sons would have. And before you go and do that whole whataboutism thing, one, it was already known that the Federated Sons had done multiple excursions into the Torian space. They were looking for any chance they could get to expand more. Two, I don't know much about Torian Concordant, but I know one thing, they super babby hate House Davion. Why? Because of the previous point I just made. They kept going in and trying to poke holes into their space and take over. Three, after the war was all said and done, Literally, the Torians and the Capellans came to an understanding in terms of, hey, if we keep doing this, the Federated Sons or Free Worlds League are just going to come and smack us in the back of the head. So how about we agree to disagree? And they kind of did. Over the years, the Torians and the Capellans have actually become not enemies or friends, they become frenemies. Let's go with that. And they often trade and exchange ideas with one another. Hell, Literally, the Torians helped the Capellans build their education system, which, again, I will say, is one of the best in the Inner Sphere. Not for propaganda, but just for teaching. And one more thing for another point. I know this is going to sound trivial, but the whole invasion was not House Liao's fault. This is actually the one time where the Capellans act like total asshats. It was not a member of House Liao leading the charge. It was another person entirely who was the overall commander of the Capellan Confederation. So there, there, there's my answer to this whole thing. No, you're right. The Capellans were the asshats. They were evil in their invasion and breaking of the Ares Convention. But there was reason for it. It wasn't just because they wanted to invade for the sake of invasion. There we go. Okay, moving on from that, our... Points three and four. I'm going to combine these two just to save on time because I really am hoping I can get this at least under 25 minutes. Points three and four are the people within the Capellan Confederation are basically brainwashed into believing that the Confederation is the only good and valid option in the Inner Sphere. Add to that, the state's justice system is an absolute joke and that there is group punishment and wrongdoing for any attempt of a citizen or servitor to literally rebel or question the government. All right, yes. Again, morally, this is unjustifiable. It is wrong, and it is pretty evil. Group punishment, simply because one person said to a commissar, hey, I think I have the right to make a joke about who is leading this planet today in the Capellan state, is not right. 
And yeah, the whole Confederation doing a whole literal firewall within its border to prevent any information from other states getting in is pretty bad. It's actually not bad. It's goddamn awful. It prevents anyone from thinking outside the box. But here's the thing. While I can't morally justify this, and while it is bad, I can understand why it happened. Again, I'm just going to repeat what I said in part one. The reason why the Capellan Confederation is the way it is, is because of interference from foreign powers. It was not formed the same way as other intersphere states. It was formed out of desperation not to be conquered. And how it was not conquered was because the citizens, in a desperate bid to keep some form of independence, gave absolute control to a government that demanded it. And then, as time went on, and war after war after war after war kept hammering them, and they kept losing territory, the only way, the only option that they figured that they could keep their independence was to give more power to the state, to which the state then used to fight off entities and foreign invaders and hold on to some semblance. All right. Yes, there is no way that that serves as a justification. But here's my response the St. Ives Compact. And I know people are already going to say that's bullshit. The St. Ives Compact, if anything, proves this point false because if given the option, citizens and servitors both would leave the Capellan Confederation. Yeah, fair enough. They didn't like it. The people in the St. Ives Compact and the people in the Chaos Marches did not want to be part of the Capellan or part of the Capellan state anymore. Fair. However, afterwards, they became puppets of who? All oh, right. Freaking Fedcom. Fedcom turned them into their own kind of like ruled over territories. And then they had to bow to them. Which, if anything, proved that Capellan Confederation right. That literally, th your choices are either follow us or be ruled over by a foreigner. And afterwards, when Sun Tzu came back, he just took them all back and guess what? Everyone was hunky-dory. They accepted it because, I don't know, did they really like St. Ives Compact? No. It turned out that they were just a puppet state of Fedcom. And the Chaos Marches, same thing. They just served as puppets for Fedcom. <sighs> God, you know what? I just depressed myself. Like, honestly, I just came to the realization the poor people they had no choice. They either had to choose between a shitty government that kind of is based on their own, like, understanding or a shitty foreign government. God. God, how do I... How do I end this now, frick? All right, never mind. I'll try. So for the third point, the whole brainwashing thing, yes, the Capellan state is not right to control the narrative. It has no justification for its whole propaganda 24-hour machine where it just pumps information and filters out anything it doesn't like. It's not cool that it has a giant freaking firewall that prevents any information from getting in and out. And yeah, it's bad. It's not right. However, as I just stated previously, there's a reason for it. There's a reason why the Capellan state is built the way it is, and there's a reason for why the government believes that this needs to be the way. St. Ives proved all of that. That if they don't, they're just going to get divided. Is it right that they go this heavy-handed? No. No, 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 it's not. Fine. You got me there. And as for point four, the whole justice system, same thing as before. The justice system with the whole group punishment, don't question the government, same thing, not cool, not fair, not right. But again, they were literally were pushed into this whole societal shift by foreign influence. Does it make it right? No. And to that whole argument, I would say as at present in terms of Battletech, timelines, it is slowly changing. Now that the Capellan state is at a point where it's no longer threatened as much by other powers within the Inner Sphere, they may become a little bit more lenient. Sun Tzu already set the ball in motion with that, with his reforms. And those were literally greeted by all the populace with universal acclaim. Is that going to continue? As time goes on, or is the state gonna double down and become super tyrannical? I can't stay, or I can't say. But for the moment, no. 
both of those points are valid. The Capellan state is not right. Okay, moving on to point five. We're almost there. All right, what is this one? Oh, yeah. All right. Members of House Liao, still comparable to other leaders in the Inner Sphere, are batshit insane. All right. As much as I would like to say that this isn't a valid point, there have been circumstances in which certain members, not all of them, within the House Liao leadership have been crazy. Downright insane. But I'm going to stand by what I said in part one also. It's nowhere near as bad as other houses. Maximilian Liao, yeah, El Diablo himself, was pretty unhinged. Making clones is never a good idea. And I mean, at the end of his life too, I'll, I'll admit it as well, as much as I love Sun Tzu, and I think he is probably candidate for top five leaders throughout all of Battletech history, fight me, I don't care, I'm going to stick to it. Him deciding to cryogenically freeze himself so that he could come back as, I don't know, some celestial god emperor? I, I honestly don't know what his end goal is with that. Was also unhinged, to say the least. And yes, Elias Leal, the founding member of House Leal, while he had noble intentions with his whole we're going to start a world revolution and get rid of all corruption and we're going to try and reset humanity. <sighs> yeah, the whole let's go moiter all the leaders and form some kind of religious super cult is not great. It's actually not even within the realm of sanity. But here is to all of that. Those are just several members and their insanity in and out fluctuated. Throughout all of the plot and story of Battletech, they weren't just crazy all the time. There were certain points where they had to go that way, whether it was because of writing or because of what was happening within the universe itself. Take for example, Maximilian. Maximilian went insane because literally he lost close to a third of the Capellan Confederation and it looked like they were on the abyss of just falling apart. As a leader, yeah, you're you're gonna go batshit crazy when you think your enemies are gonna take over and your head's on the chopping block. Yeah, you're gonna go there and wanna go to cuckoo land. Elias Liao, for all his crazy esoteric ravings about trying to restart humanity, did so with a plan. Yeah, the whole we're gonna become a religious kind of esoteric belief system not so great but i gotta look more into it i don't really think it was him that did that i have to confirm i might be wrong if i'm wrong tell me but i don't think Lee, uh, elias liao actually created that whole what is it like political cult i think all he really wanted to do was just like change how the government on terra was just an absolute authoritarian monstrosity, which is actually kind of ironically sad that Elias Liao had these great expectations and then it turned out that the state that he would help found or his family would help found would become the very thing that he sought to fight against. And as for Sun Tzu, and listen, I know there are other members of House Liao that our people are going to point to and say, don't cherry pick the top three most popular ones. Those are the ones I know the most of. Sorry, I have to go with what I know. I can't I can't make stuff up. Sun Tzu's whole end strategy of freezing himself and just, I don't know, creating a cult of personality. I'm going to say the same thing as Elias. I don't think he was thinking that far ahead. I think, honestly, he just wanted to create some form of assurance that if things got really effing bad, he could just come back and save the Capellan Confederation. Because, all right, you know what? I'll, I'll say this. Sun Tzu, for as much as I love to fanboy about him, was a megalomaniac. He thought he was the only one who could save the Capellan Confederation. And even though he's right, and he's 100% right, really, freezing yourself so that you could come back as a messiah? Nah, don't. Yeah. Frick, this is why people don't even like the Dark Gate. Never mind. Let's just leave it at that. Yes, there are certain members of House Leal that are unhinged. 
but I don't think it's enough to justify giving them the evil stick or the bat even the bad stick. There have been, in terms of number for number, been more rulers of House Leal that have been good compared to those that have been bad or crazy. I'm going to go with that. Okay, sixth and final point. Here we go. What aboutism in relation to the wrongdoing of other inner sphere states is not a valid argument. It does not mean that the Capellan state is not evil for how it acts or operates. All right. I really don't think I have a counterpoint to this. This is very, very valid. While I feel that the other inner sphere states had a hand in the very creation and inception of the Capellan Confederation and are the reason why the state operates as it does, it does not justify how the Capellan Confederation treats its citizens, treats other inner sphere states, or helps in its decision process. I have to be real. The Capellan Confederation is in charge of that. And their actions throughout the timeline of Battletech have varied from justifiable reasons to selfish ones. I can't, I can't make stuff up and I can't sugarcoat it. The Capellan State have done some pretty awful things in order to achieve selfish ambitions and gains. Whether those are strategic or for a purpose, it doesn't change the fact that they were done with Capellan leaders in Capellan positions in order to get what they considered theirs. And as other previous points we've already covered, it doesn't justify how they've created a crappy justice system, a state that literally pushes propaganda and allows for no second opinions, protects members of a certain house from any sort of punishment for acting in moments of unhinged instability, allows for invasions of foreign powers that have done no wrong, and a list of other things. All right, fine. I will admit that the Capellan state is in itself fundamentally flawed. However, I think the only thing I can say in response to that is, while the state is flawed and its decision-making is its own, the Capellan people did nothing wrong. They are not to blame for the problems of a state. And yes, you could say that the Capellan people, compared to other nations, act in strange, unhinged ways of terms of over-patriotic actions or just hyper-aggressive patriotism that pushes them to the point of being dogmatic. But then again, I guess that would be a counter argument to you, which is you're now using whataboutism in reference to how other states act in terms of how the Capellan people act. The Capellan people, I don't think, are guilty of anything. If anything, this whole, oh my god, really? 30 minutes? Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sum this up quick because I don't think anyone's even listening at this point. The Capellan people have done nothing wrong in how they have been treated or how they have acted. They have honestly never had a say in how they should be treated in the inner sphere. They have had to simply live with what was given to them and live with the reality of the situation. For a real moment, I'm just going to be honest. The Capellan citizenry, both those who have citizenship and those who do not, have been born, raised, and die in a universe that does not care for them, that does not give them any sort of advantage or give them any sort of leniency or mercy. They are born in a state which survived only because it acted utterly ruthless and authoritarian. They are wedged between major powers that seek to dominate and pretty much conquer them and force them under rulership that they don't want, regardless of how they would voice their opinions. And that is the case. Regardless of who would take over if the Capellan state failed, you better believe that they are going to be just as oppressed 
Because there's no way those people are going to let them decide their own fate. So, man. God, did I just depress myself again? Frick. I was really hoping to lighten the mood with this one. Oh, God. <sighs> okay, closing thoughts. Well, I'll, I'll leave it on this. Looking back now at both part one and part two of this episode, I am in conflicting opinions. On one hand, this parter, with all the points pointed out by you guys, has left me to admit that yes, the Capellans are not right in terms of how the state has operated. It is not fair, nor is it justifiable that they treat people both inside and outside Capellan space the way they do. And the leadership is to blame for its own actions, regardless of past or historical problems with other neighbors. However, I will stand by this. There is an old saying that goes that if you treat someone a certain way, over time, that person will become the thing you treat them as. And the Capellan Confederation has not been treated well by anyone. No one has treated the Capellans with a fair and even hand, and they've always been viewed as either a nuisance at best or a threat at worst. The Capellan people, who have no fair say in how they are treated or represented in their government, other than providing support for it in order to survive, are now seen as nothing more than dogmatic, nationalist, brainwashed people. Which I honestly cannot agree with. The people, again, have never had a say, either from within or without the state. They've just had to survive. And surviving is not a crime. Not yet, anyway. In conclusion, I'll probably just end it with these three points. One, yes, the Capellan state has done horrible things, and it needs to be held accountable for those things. Two, the leadership of the Capellan Confederation, namely House Liao, while having done some questionable things, are not bad, or evil, if you'd like to say. They've done what any other house in the Inner Sphere has, which is try to look out for themselves and their people. In the case of House Liao, I'd honestly say they have looked out more for their people than any other house. Except maybe ugh, Davion, if I have to admit something. Fine, I'll give Davion that. And finally, for the people, no. The Capellans themselves are not evil. They're not wrong and they haven't done any wrong. Again, I'll say and reiterate what I've previously just stated. They're just trying to survive. And that is not a crime. Or, you know what, whatever, I could be completely wrong now. With Ilkhan on the horizon, this could all change on a heartbeat. Since the Capellan Confederation now is one of the strongest powers, they could literally take everything I've just said and turn it upside down and just be like, hey, Clan Wolf, it's time for a beating. And who knows, maybe that itself is a 180. Maybe this whole Ilkhan present day timeline is just going to lead up to the Capellan Confederation liberating the inner sphere. Oh my god. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine the salt that will happen if it's actually the Capellans that rescue the inner sphere from the rule of freaking the clans? Okay. Oh, I, I, oh god. That, that, is, that is a gold mine. That is an episode in the making. But that will have to wait. Next time on the next Dropship Banter, I think we're going to take a look at someone a little less controversial. We're going to jump right into the Free Worlds League. I know I said Draconis Combine, but you know what? We're going to stick going in a clockwise manner. God. <laughs> the Combine really, oh, it's going to have its time to shine. But no, we're leaving the Confederation behind us, and we're going to move over to House Merrick and the Free Worlds League. And you're going to hear about the wonderful, horrible mess that that is. Until then, I'm Frozen Front, and this has been Dropship Banter. Until next time, guys, peace out. <laughs>